In this video, we will examine the response of a damped system subjected to general harmonic loading. Here we have our mass spring system with a damper. It's being subjected to a harmonic force that we're going to call F sub zero, which is the magnitude times e to the i omega, that a lot of people freeze up when they see complex analysis. It's something kind of foreign to mechanical engineering students quite often. Uh, the electrical engineers, I find, are much more comfortable with this. So I'm going to do a slight digression and just talk a little bit about complex analysis. Um, it's not designed to be a video in complex analysis, but I do want to just give a, a few pointers. So whereas a real number can be plotted on a number line, a complex number requires a plane where we'll call the horizontal axis the real part and the vertical axis the imaginary part. And we can take some arbitrary point here draw a vector to that point from the origin. And that point can be written as x plus i y, where x is the real part and y is the imaginary part. And this would be x here, and this would be y here. Okay. So in a Cartesian sense, I can write it in terms of x and y, x equals uh, x plus i, y. But I could also write it in polar coordinates, where we would call this r, and we'd call this angle theta. Excuse me, we'll call it phi. And r is the magnitude, and phi is often called the argument or the phase in the case of mechanical engineering problems. So the phase, which is the angle of this vector, uh, between the vector and the, uh, the x-axis. All right, so a general point z, we'll call z a complex number, is equal to x plus i, y. Okay. Um, complex conjugate of z, which is generally written z bar, would be x minus i, y. The complex conjugate, I'll do it in a different color, would just be the reflection of this point about, about the x-axis. So this point here would be x minus i, y, which is equal to the complement of z. The subtop is z. Okay, This angle in this case would be minus phi. Wait, let me make that a little neater. Uh, minus phi. Okay. I can choose to write this in polar coordinates. Um, and the way I would do that is I would say x can be rewritten as r times cosine of phi. It's just straight trigonometry. y or i y can be written as r times i sine of phi. This implies that z, which is equal to x plus i y, can be written as, let me take the r out, r times cosine of phi plus i sine phi. Does anyone remember what that is? That is equal to r times e to the i phi and that's due to Euler's formula. Okay, I can also write, let me just put a line here. Um, if I want to calculate r, r by Pythagoras is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. And you should be able to see from the, the drawing that phi is just equal to the arctangent. Tangent of phi is equal to the y, or the imaginary part, divided by x. So phi is equal to the arctangent, or inverse tangent, of y divided by x. Okay, so with that, let's get started on the problem at hand. I've got this mass spring system that I've just kind of butchered now. Uh, let me neaten this up. This is F naught e to the i 
omega t. All right, so the equations of motion can be written out. That's mx double dot plus cx plus cx dot, excuse me, plus kx is equal to f sub zero e to the i omega t, which is the external force. Okay, and I'll remind you that because of Euler's formula, this external force is a general case of harmonic loading because it incorporates both sine and cosine, the sine and cosine function. All right, we dealt with the transient solution in a number of videos. In this video, we're going to look only at the particular solution or the steady state response, as it's called in mechanical vibrations. All right, so we can write the response as, and, and let me mention that these x's, I've omitted the x of t, the t dependency, it should be implied that all the x's are a function of time. I'm just leaving it out for shorthand, else it gets too cluttered. Um, that said, the x sub p of t, the particular response or steady state response, can be written as x, which is some magnitude. I'm going to write this as a capital X, well, put my little bars on it, that means a capital X, times e to the i omega t. So what have we done? We've assumed that since it's a harmonic loading, uh, we're going to assume a harmonic response of the form of x times e to the i omega t. And we proceed like we've seen in previous videos where we take the derivative, the first derivative, x dot p of t, is equal to i omega x e to the i omega t. That will be equation 3. And similarly, we can take the second derivative, x sub p of t is equal to, I'm just going to multiply again by i omega. Each time I take the derivative, I'm multiplying by i omega. In this case, i squared is minus 1. i is the square root of negative 1. I should probably have written that here somewhere. That should be implied. i is the square root of negative 1. It's an imaginary number. And the second derivative of, of x sub p is equal to minus omega squared times capital X e to the i omega t. That's equation 4. And so we're going to take equations 2, 3, and 4 and substitute that into equation 1. Let me write that. Substitute equations 2 to 4 into equation 1, and we end up with, let me write it this way, minus m omega squared plus i c omega uh, plus k times capital X e to the i omega t is equal to the right-hand side of equation 1, which is f sub 0 e to the i omega t. Now, of course, the e to the i omega t, those are the same. So therefore, the coefficients of those must be equal. Um, so we equate the coefficients. We, we're trying to, by the way, I should have mentioned, we're trying to solve for the magnitude x, the magnitude of the response. That's the goal here. So we're going to take this equation. I'll call it equation 5. And we're going to solve it for x. Capital X is equal to f sub 0 divided by, uh, let's see how I want to do this. I'm going to group the real and imaginary parts separately. So k minus m omega squared plus i times c omega. I've just chosen to, to write the parentheses just so I can show you that the one part is multiplied by i, that's the imaginary part, and the other part is the real part. Okay. Now, the next thing we need to do is we want to clear this i from our denominator. You remember how to do that? We've got to multiply by the complex conjugate. So what we do in this case is we want to multiply effectively by 1. Let me write it out and then we'll talk about it. So k minus m omega squared minus i times c omega divided by the same thing, k minus m omega squared 
minus i times c omega. So this green part is just equal to 1. All I've done is I've taken this equation and multiplied it by 1, but it will allow us to write it in a slightly different form now, and that is, um, let's see, I want to do this. So I'm going to take this out of the parentheses. I'm going to write it as f0 divided by, oh, and then that, divided by k minus omega squared, uh, minus m omega squared times k minus m omega squared is k minus m omega squared quantity squared. And then I've got an i times c omega minus i times c omega. i times i is minus 1, times a minus is plus 1. So we get a plus here, and we get c omega squared. Okay. And then that's going to be multiplied by k minus m omega squared minus i times c omega, which is just the numerator of this part. Okay? So again, the numerator of this part goes down here. The denominator here multiplies the denominator here, and I get this result. Sorry for the mess. But now, what you see, what you should be able to see is we've got some constant here, positive constant, because I remind you that k, m, c, and omega are all greater than zero. Okay, and now we have an imaginary part and we have a real part. So I want to rewrite this as f zero divided by uh, k minus m omega squared quantity squared plus c omega quantity squared times this part here I want to be able to rewrite it as I'll put in parentheses r times e to the i phi we'll call it in fact, it's negative i phi. So let me just say why. This is a negative i. So instead of it being e to the i phi, it will be e to the minus i phi. Remember I showed you up here how when the imaginary part is negative, phi is negative. When the imaginary part, i, y, is positive, then phi will be positive in this case. All right? And since I'm out of space, I'll continue this on the next page. This from the previous page where we said that x could be written as some uh, constant multiplied by a uh, complex number, and instead of an xy representation or Cartesian representation of this complex number, we'd like to write it as a polar representation. Okay, and we know how to do this. This I, I showed you on the previous page. I'll do it on the side here in red. That r is simply equal to the square root of the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. So k minus m omega squared quantity squared plus c omega quantity squared, and it's the square root of that. Now notice that this is just the square root of the denominator over here. Okay, Before I substitute that in, let's solve for phi. Phi is just simply the imaginary part divided by the real part, and take the arctangent of that. And again, I've, I've put the negative sign in here, so we can use the positive value of the imaginary part. Let me write it out, and I think it'll make more sense. So phi is equal to the arctangent, or the inverse tangent, of C omega divided by k minus m omega squared. Okay, And when I substitute r in here, I find that the numerator and the denominator are different. In other words, rewriting this, I can write it as f0 divided by k minus m omega squared quantity squared plus c omega squared, and this will just on the bottom. So I've got this on the bottom, I've got the square root of this on the top. When I divide the two, I end up with the square root on the bottom. 
okay, times e to the minus i phi. And I'm going to leave it as, uh, I'm not going to substitute the phi in here at this point, just for neatness. All right. Now, what are we going to number this? From the previous page, number 5, let's give these some numbers. So this will be 6, this will be 7, and this will be 8. Now, what we found is the amplitude x of the response. Remember, if you go back to the previous, find this response. And in particular, what we wanted to do is find x, the x part of the response. Okay, so now we found x, so the last thing remaining to do is to take our, um, our expression for x and substitute it back into equation 2. So, equation 8 into equation 2, and we find that, whoops, x particular of t is equal to f0 divided by this denominator k minus m omega squared quantity squared plus c omega quantity squared square root of that times e to the times again from the previous page e to the i omega t right as I fight with this um, so this is times e to the i omega t. But I can combine these. I multiply by e. Let me just write it in place to save myself a bit of space. This would therefore be e to the i omega t minus phi. And that's your solution. Okay. So let me just run through it again really quickly. What we did is we took our equation of motion with a generalized harmonic loading. We um, assumed a solution of the form x e to the i omega t, which is harmonic. We substituted all of this in in an attempt to solve for the magnitude of the response. We found that the magnitude of the response turned out to be a complex number. And then we took that complex number, wrote the coordinates, we did this on this page, and then we put it all back together here in this last line. Okay? And the last thing I'd like to do is just try to draw you a, a sort of an explanation as to what we're seeing. So if we take the imaginary plane here, the vertical axis is imaginary, and the horizontal axis is real, we had a forcing function that looked something like this. F0 e to the i omega t. And I remind you that, uh, and I showed this in a previous video, I'm going to put the link right above here, but, uh, and that was the video on harmonic motion, that you can think of this vector as spinning with an angular frequency of omega. So after a time t, this has actually gone through an angle of omega t. Okay, and it's continually moving with time. What we found is that the response is also harmonic, and in this case, the response lags the, the, uh, the loading by an amount phi, or negative phi in this case. It lags by phi. The phase difference is negative phi. Um, another thing that came out of this is if we look at phi, phi is the imaginary part divided by the real part. In other words, if there's no damping C, then phi is zero. So it's the damping in the system that causes this lag in the response. In other words, if there were no damping in the system, then this blue vector would lie right on top of the red vector. And as the forcing function reached its, its uh, maximum amplitude, so the response would reach its maximum amplitude. As the forcing, forcing function was zero, so the response would be zero. They would be completely in phase. In general, with a damped system, the response will lag. It will lag behind the, uh, the forcing function by an amount phi, and that's due to the damping. Anyway, that's all I want to say about this video. I hope you found something useful in it. I'd love to hear from you in the comments below if you have any questions. Otherwise, please go and give this a thumbs up if you found you learned something useful so that others can get to see it too. Thank you for watching, and I'll catch up with you in the next video.